count jury. We're all watching this right now, right? What are they going to do? Well, we know what they just did do, which was ask the judge a question. And what all that is is essentially the jury writes down a piece of paper, hands it to the bailiff. We have a question. We want to see something. In this case, they want to see some testimony from uh, Michael Cohen, Trump's uh, attorney, and David Pecker from the National Enquirer that kind of ran the Trump like cover up uh, policy, right? So going back to the basics really quick, like what's going to happen in a jury? And just so you know, I'm a jury consultant. I've served on a jury duty myself. I've ran countless uh, focus groups where we essentially do a mock trial in front of people that we turn into a jury and have them deliberate, deliberate over, um, over a, re a real case, right. And see how, see how it goes. So I do have a lot of kind of insight here on the way kind of the groups, the group dynamics are, uh, in, in jury. So I want to talk about that uh, a little bit. Uh, so again, going back to the beginning, if when the jury gets sent to the jury room to, to deliberate, first they hear all those instructions from the judge on what they have to do and following the law. Then when they go in there, they pick the four person. And we'll just we'll just say that that the that you know juror number one is the is the the four person, and they can they can vote. Someone can just volunteer themselves. That they can just appoint someone. I think in this case, there's two lawyers on the jury, and one of those lawyers is probably going to be the four person. Or I would assume that most of the jurors would ask that one of them would be the four person. But what's very instructive about them asking a question is telling me there's already disagreement in the in the jury, because when this usually happens, right, and having observed this myself and, and participated, it, it served on a jury, is when there's at least one juror that is not agreeing with the rest of the group, and so people in the group will essentially try to convince that juror by asking them, okay, well, why? And in this case, they're probably gonna be like, oh, well, what Michael Cohen said. Uh, you know, didn't coincide with what David Pecker said or something to that effect. And probably one of the people who believes Trump is guilty is going to say, no, 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 you, you, you got it wrong. I was taking notes. I was listening. And they'll ask for that testimony to be, you know, played for them again so they can kind of set the record straight. And then, you know, I, I've, I've seen it where that doesn't even affect the person's mind. And obviously, like, we're talking about politics. We're talking about Donald Trump. People have very religious views when it comes to politics, as in, like, evidence doesn't necessarily sway them, you know, one, one way or the other. It's just sort of like, hey, this is the guy on my team. I don't I don't really care. Right. And especially in a case like like this, which of all the things Trump accused of is is pretty is pretty trivial. Right. But thankfully, it's what case we'll get to see before before the election. Um, and just going to group dynamics a second, because I love to point this out because I've seen it in every single focus group and when I've been on it on a jury is there's always a person, we'll just call juror number four, the talker. And then we'll just call like juror number nine, like the quiet one. The quiet one. And then just for fun, like we'll call like eight and 10, the sheep. And these are the people that, you know, that they'll talk and contribute, but they'll generally just go along with what the group is doing. They want to get out of there. It's going to be Friday soon, the weekend. These people are just going to want to go home. Sheep will just kind of go along with the group. The talkers, exactly what it sounds like. There's always one or two uh, uh, people on the jury that they'll respond to every single person's point. So if they go around and go, hey, well, how do you feel about X? Juror number one will say something. Talker responds to it. Juror number three will say something, talker responds to it all the way, all the way down. And what I would do just for the sake of efficiency when I would run, when I would run these mock juries is like warn them of that. And even despite the warning, these talkers, they just, they don't have ears, right? And they'll, they'll still do it. So I, I never found a way to prevent this from happening. So I guarantee there's at least one or two people like that on the jury. And then for sure there's like, you know, I don't actually want to say for sure this time because we are talking about po like politics, right? Where everyone has an, an opinion and we know what's going on. This isn't some brand new case. But the quiet ones, they just like, even if you ask them a direct question, they'll just, you know, give a non-answer. Um, and I, I think a lot of that just has to do with people just being introverts and just in a like pretty, you know, big group setting, um, be a little bit intimidated. However, we're talking about New York City here, right? So um, I'll still stand behind that there's probably some quiet people on the jury, but, um, you know, not ones that are going to get, get bowled over. So, 
again, you know, going back to them asking for this testimony, that's telling me that there's some, there's some disagreements in the group. And again, we're talking about like politics. Remember, like these people, they got jury instructions saying, can't tell the people, uh, you know, you can't put on social media. You can't tell your friends, your family, anything about the case. You can tell them you're going to jury duty, but they get very strict instructions. They're not to tell people about the case that they're on. Now, do you believe that all the 12 of those people went home and like told that their family members that, you know, they're on some, uh, you know, car accident case or whatever, right? Made up a lie. I don't. So at the end of the case though, they can talk to whoever they want about whatever they want, right? So like, imagine you're a conservative person, your circle of friends are Trump people or Republicans, and you're going to be the one that goes home and says that, you know, you found Donald, Donald Trump guilty. You know, same if you were the, you know, more liberal people and this is your chance to like, you know, give this guy who's clearly a criminal minded, uh, you know, his, his chance at justice and you didn't because, you know, you were, you were standing by, you know, our favorite, our favorite word is defense attorneys, reasonable doubt, right? And that's a very high standard. And as you would imagine, they argued in closing arguments, the defense did that like Michael Cohen is the embodiment of reasonable doubt. And of course the prosecution's like, hey, we didn't get Michael Cohen at like witness R us. Like that's who Trump associates himself with, you know, liars and people without morals. It's like not our fault, but look at the evidence and does the things, things that this liar said, is it corroborated by the facts? Now in this case, obviously it, it, it is, right? But Michael Cohen is a liar, a perjurer and a thief, right? So it's very easy if, if this was a, in fact, I would say if this was just a case where like this person was not known to the public and you were just, you know, just some like a business type of case and you had that type of witness with such a horrible background, I would say that it would be very, very likely that the defendant in this case, if it wasn't Donald Trump, would be found not guilty if you just had someone that was just so you know disgraceful come in, even though there's a mountain of evidence, of course, corro corroborating what he said, and of course, I don't think anyone, putting reasonable doubt aside, believes that Donald Trump didn't have sex with Stormy Daniels. That's that's pretty obvious. There's pictures of them uh, together. The detail in her her testimony was very high, and he did he did not you know testify, um, you know himself to refute any of it. And to that point, I do want to say something. Having done a lot of of, of criminal cases, where even if my client was like technically guilty or actually guilty or did something wrong that maybe wasn't exactly what they were charged with, you know, a lot of times those people don't testify for several reasons, right? Like you can bring up certain things about people's backgrounds that would make them look bad as a, as a witness. So there's lots of reasons that people don't testify, but what I've learned in jury selection when I know my client isn't going to testify, like one thing I'll ask the jury is, and again, not this jury, just this, the pool of people you would ask to eventually be this jury. One thing I'll always ask is like, you know, if, if you were accused of a crime and you didn't do it, I mean, wouldn't it take a team of wild horses or a bulldozer to pull you off the witness stand? And many, many people are like, absolutely. Like if I was falsely accused, which, you know, Trump claims he is, that he's saying this is complete, BS, right? That you know, they all say that they would testify and get up there. And I think that's what we all think, right? Like if I'm accused of this, I'm going to get up there. And if, and of course, like what's Trump done to like inoculate his base from this reality, right? He's even gone as far as to say that Judge Marchand's uh, gag order keeps him from testifying. He actually said that. Go Google me and, and if I'm lying, I'll send you a thousand dollars. He actually said that the gag order was keeping him from testifying. Then he gets asked about it again later in an interview. And his then his reason uh, for not testifying was that because, again, Judge Marchand's rulings made it impossible for him to testify because people can bring up your past, which then a few seconds later he says, but I, I, I'm happy to talk about the past. So he actually gave no, an, no answer as to why he didn't testify. And, of course, we know why he didn't testify is because there's a mountain of evidence against him, right? And then his any statements he's made outside of court contradicting what he says in court would be brought in as impeachment evidence, right? And and so I'm gonna impeachment evidence is interesting because 
when you're talking about a former president, I know when people see that word and we're talking about a president that's been impeached twice, you hear that and you must think like it has something to do with him being impeached. It has, it has nothing to do with that at, at all. It's impeachment evidence is just evidence that like contradicts what's what the person's saying. So if, um, you know, and with Trump, it's easy because he's, there's so many clips of him saying one thing one day and one the other. So if he gets on the witness stand and takes positions that he said the opposite of in public, or even if it's not his statements, it could be just evidence that contradicts what he said, then that can be used to impeach his credibility as a witness. And also, you know, Trump doesn't have the ability to really like, you know, answer the questions directly as they're asked, which would be a mess. And so I'm sure his attorney advised him not to. Um, but I, I honestly, I think even if his attorney did advise him um, to testify, I think Trump is probably smart enough to know that he should not have should not testify in that case. Like I certainly would have advised him not not to do it. Um, because there's just so much like damning uh, evidence and, and you know and, and contradictions and he's just he's just said so many uh, many things publicly that it's, it's like it's on tape you know like what what are you gonna what are you gonna do about that so uh, final point uh, in reading this on on Fox News by the way I, I check all the news sources right like you've seen my other videos you know I'm a Dwight Eisenhower Republican right like I don't want to hear any of this like lefty nonsense okay that uh, the Fox News was talking about uh, things that Trump said about Judge Marshawn, saying that he is the most corrupt judge. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And even Fox had to go, like, Trump didn't provide any further details on how Judge Marshawn is, is corrupt, right? Of course, the only single thing that he can bring up, right, is that Judge Marshawn's daughter has posted things on social media um, about wanting to see Donald Trump uh, in, in jail, right? And if that makes somebody corrupt, now let's think about this. Where are these Republicans, you know, bringing up, uh, you know, Clarence Thomas, right? Like his wife fully pushed the, the ridiculous stolen election narrative, um, was, was a proponent of January 6th. Um, Judge Alito's wife, you know, hung that flag upside down and another flag um, that's you know, both associated with the kind of, you know, the big lie. Um, and these kind of pro-Trump positions, and they're not recusing themselves from the cases that involve Donald Trump. So these people that say Marshawn is, is corrupt, like consider this, we have a jury to put a check on the judge, right? You have an appeals court to put a check on a judge. In the Supreme Court, that's, that's the uh, court of last resort, right? Like there's no, there's no checks on a Supreme Court besides essentially a constitutional amendment, right? So. So if you do believe Judge Mershon is, is corrupt because his daughter wants to see Trump in jail or because Judge Mershon's donated to the Democratic Party before, so is Donald Trump, by the way, um, then I would just love to see that same logic applied uh, to Clarence Thomas and Judge Alito and any justice that is, you know, in their personal life, you know, had relationships with things that are contrary to the, that have a, a, a position, um, or a strong opinion in the cases that they're they're ruling on. So let's just keep it equal, folks. Right? Let's let's stay consistent with with the logic. Um, you know, my personal opinion is judges are people. Trump's a polarizing figure. A judge is going to have a strong opinion one way or the other. That's why we have juries, and that's why we have an appeals court. Right? If you found this information useful, if you have more questions, just dive right into the comments. I'll answer all of them. Go check out my other videos. I answer all the comments. Um, if I get enough subscribers, I will like live stream. And you can get, you know, free, free marginal legal commentary from an actual attorney and jury insult, consultant, <laughs> consultant. So hit the subscribe and give me some comments and some questions. Because you saw I kind of took a break on videos, guys. I feel bad about that. Give me, give me some reasons to make more and I'm at your service. I got this, I got this big whiteboard, right? It's pretty, it's pretty cool. I can do kinds of the fun stuff on it for you. All right. Holler at me.